I've never done this before in my life, and I'm probably just talking to a tree right now, but if you're there, I need to give you a heads up. The world we come from, there's no green there. They killed their mother, and they're going to do the same thing here. More sky people are going to come. They're going to come like rain that never ends until they've covered the world, unless we stop them. Look, you chose me for something, and I'll stand and fight. You know I will, but I could use a little help here. Today, in anticipation of the new Avatar, The Way of Water movie, we are talking about James Cameron 2009 film, Avatar. Welcome to Pop Culture Catechism, conversations about music, movies, and the longings of the human heart. Let's get started. What is nature and what is natural? And when humans are acting in accord with nature, what does that mean? If we're acting in accord with nature, does that mean that we're protecting our environment? But isn't it also human nature to, to take and use and manipulate our environment? I mean, we, we make fires and then we build huts and then we build bigger huts and then we build roads and our societies have, 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 have covered the world in our civilization. I mean, isn't what that part of what it means to be human is to, to civilize, to tame what is wild, to bring order to the chaos? Isn't that part of our nature? To turn that tree into a spear or a fence or a house. And when we look at the natural world, it's beautiful, but it's also a dangerous harsh, terrifying thing. And humans have tamed it. And that's also beautiful, but that is also dangerous and harsh and terrifying in what we've done to our world. And for as long as humans have been around, our relationship to the natural world has been central to our identity, to our lives and to our meaning and to how we act. Today, we're talking about James Cameron's famous film from 2009, Avatar, because the, the new movie, Avatar Way of Water, is coming out uh, just this month. And it wrestles with these questions of what is our place in the world? What is our nature of us as humans in relation to the natural world around us? And th this whole discussion of what is artificial and what is natural and how we fit in the natural world and how we treat those who are different than us. What does it mean to be a person versus an animal? So these are all questions we're going to dive into today, and I'm happy to be joined uh, once again by my good friend and the founder and uh, president of Awakened Catholic, Nick De La Torre. And uh, if you don't know who I am, I am Mike Tenney, Catholic speaker and worship leader from Washington, D.C. I spent over a decade teaching Catholic high school theology and also trying to make it big as a rock star. And now I'm blessed to speak and lead music for thousands of people each year at events all over the place. And through this show, Pop Culture Catechism, this is Pop Culture Catechism, the gospel according to pop music in movies where we look for God's love and the media that you're plugged into. So then when we're done, when we unplug and we put down our phones and our iPads and our laptops, we can actually go out in the real world and know God's love and live God's love and love God's people and hopefully love God's creation in the way that Jesus intended for us to do. So our goal by the end of this episode is not only will you have a deeper appreciation for the Avatar movies, but you'll also have some practical, tangible, actionable ideas for how to go out in the world today and live God's love and know God's love better. I want to give a special thank you to our patrons who make this show possible through popculturecatechism.com and the Awaken Catholic app, and also to our sponsor for this episode, Catholic Merch dot store where you can get awesome catholic swag like nick de la Torre is wearing right now that awesome hoodie with monstrous monstrances and saints and stuff all over it so uh, this is the wanna, uber catholic hoodie the uber catholic hoodie i want to welcome to the show once again nick de la Torre. thanks for having nick, me mike yeah it's good to have you back it's good so, to have you back i think i think most people who have watched my show have have you 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 did the Lincoln Park episode with us. You were on our first WAP episode with Cardi B and Megan <laughs> The Stallion. We did the Spider Man episode together. Um, uh, you sat in on the God of War episode that we did. So you've been on this show quite a bit. I think you're you're probably tied with John Mark as my most frequent guest at this point. Um, but for those who don't know, you can just tell us a, a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, like you said earlier, I'm the president of Awakened Catholic. Super, super honored and 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 passionate about the work that we're. Uh, I'm honored to be a part of this work, and I'm passionate about the work we're doing. Um, bringing these important uh, messages, uh, approaches to thinking about the world, uh, in particular from a Catholic worldview, uh, bringing that to new audiences through through uh, cutting edge media, and um, in particular now through our Awaken app, which is uh, coming soon. Really, really excited about it, um, and honestly, just so honored and humbled to to be your friend, Mike. You make me you a better well. man. You make me a better man. <laughs> We've been awesome. talking about doing this episode 
since the inception of the show. Yeah, the very first time I came to Awakened Catholic and we did the first four episodes and uh, we were like, well, we got we to film some more and we're kind of scrambling for things to talk about. You were like, oh, Avatar. And so I like put it in my notes. And ever since then, or, you know, because they, they've been talking about doing a sequel. So I was like, all right, when the sequel comes out, we're going to do this episode. And then a few weeks ago, it was like, oh, that's in a few weeks. We right. need to do this episode <laughs> now. <laughs> so uh, it's time. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, and uh, kind of some exciting things that that you've been doing is, uh, you know, Awaken Catholic originally. Correct me if I'm wrong on any of the history of this. Originally, when it started, was you rather than more of an online ministry, it was more focused on like parish missions and events. But that was like in February of 2020 when you launched, and so COVID shut down the world. And uh, but the last few months, you've really been starting to do more of those events. You like got an RV where you're like your family's driving around and <laughs> doing events now. Um, and I've, I've booked a few parish missions as well. So uh, listeners, if you're out there, if you work in ministry at a school or a parish or any of those things you're looking for, uh, music, if you're looking for a parish mission, you're looking for a speaker, uh, you can go to awakencatholic.org uh, and you can, you can hire Nick, you can hire me, uh, and we will come and do our thing and yeah. uh, talk, talk about Jesus and sing about Jesus uh, with, your, with your community. So we would love to do that. Yeah, you're 100% right about the history that you just laid out. That, that's exactly it. And uh, we are booking uh, parish missions right now for Lent. And so if you want to bring Mike or I to your parish during Lent, just reach out to us. Nice. Yeah, I already got one. I got one during Lent, one during Easter already. So. Beautiful. Yeah, it's going to be a busy, busy and beautiful spring. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you don't know about James Cameron's Avatar uh, from 2009, it was like the biggest movie ever at mm -hmm. the time. I think it's probably been been eclipsed in terms of like gross earnings yeah. since then. But it also wasn't um, his first time doing that. Titanic yeah. was also <laughs> James. Like he doesn't do small yeah. things. <laughs> and he did. Didn't he do Terminator too? Oh, did um, he? I think. I don't know if that might not be right, but uh, anyway, he's done a bunch of things. Um, but the co the original cost was between two hundred eighty and three hundred ten million for production, and one hundred fifty more for promotion. <laughs> Which it was the first with inflation like that. Those numbers yeah. are so much bigger related to like our money now. <laughs> It was it was the first movie to use like motion capture where they have like the the dots on the actors' faces and then or I guess it was it was the second one because the Lord of the Rings with Gollum was the first but this oh, was the sure. one the, the first one to do it for like a whole cast um and that kind of revolutionized the technology it was also uh, I think it was the the first or one it was the first big movie that did 3D and you could actually see it in 3D in the theaters so it it was um, yeah I a know big that deal there a was a Terminator ways. movie that I think was made in 3D before that but it was mm. like Again, with the scale of the release of this movie, like nothing compared to it. Wow. It became the first film to gross more than $2 billion, <laughs> um, which uh, interestingly enough, I was reading yesterday, the new one, The Way of Water, uh, it costs $2 billion to make. So it's this movie is going to have to be like in the top five of the highest grossing movies of all time just to oh break gosh. even if it wants to break even. So it's got its work cut out for us. That's utter so, madness. And I, I'm also wondering madness. if some of that cost was shared with the next and subsequent and subsequent sequels because I think he was working yeah. on Avatar 2 through 5 simultaneously. So I wonder how wow. much of that $2 billion was like a shared cost because I know that he had to like – invent new technologies to create this and like a lot of that was probably also research and development so yeah probably yeah all right well let's talk about this movie so there's so much to love about this movie what do you love about this movie just speaking sp speaking purely artistically and then we'll get into some of the themes as we go well i mean when it came out what a stunning and groundbreaking visual achievement i mean mm -hmm. you know you were talking about some of the technology like the motion capture and and uh the 3d stuff but like just as a as a as an end result like what an incredible visually stunning experience james cameron created there um up until that point like really nothing had existed like it it was it was truly extraordinary and like a, a landmark historical thing. It really, I mean, cinematically, it really was. Um, so I just love visually just how beautiful it is. Like it just it made you wish that you were super rich so you could afford the most expensive TV in the world to watch it at home with it. You yes. know, uh -huh. <laughs> like, it's just incredible. 
Yeah, when I we when we first moved into our house, one of the projects that we did is we we put we bought like a projector. It's not like super expensive, but it's like a projector and a screen, so it's it's really big, even though it's not super high quality. But like one of the first things we watched was Avatar, just because it's like what's a what's a movie we should watch on a big screen? It's like Avatar is like one of those things, and I. I don't know if you're familiar with this concept called the uncanny valley. Oh yeah. Where like in human psychology, if stuff looks like too, like if it looks close to human, but not quite, it kind of creeps you out. Mm -hmm. This is why like sometimes clowns or like dolls can seem kind of creepy to people. And if you ever watch toy story one, the humans in toy story one look like so creepy Oh yeah. <laughs> as opposed to the toys. Especially and that's why Sid. in Yeah. Sid. Yeah. But in, in later toy story movies and uh, later Pixar stuff, they made the people look much more cartoonish so that it doesn't give you that uncanny Valley feel. And I feel like there, there were a few CGI movies before this. I'm thinking there was, there was like that final fantasy movie and it always kind of had that uncanny Valley feel. And this was the first like, highly cgi movie i remember seeing that was like whoa this actually like i, I could let myself get lost in it like it just seems it real so it well doesn't done. seem like i'm watching computer graphics it just yeah. looks real to me you know i think the worst so. example of what you're talking about with the uncanny valley which i don't even know if uncanny valley is the problem with it but freaking the scorpion king in the movie i knew you were gonna say the that. mummy <laughs> the mummy and the scorpion king it's so bad it's so it's, bad it's so bad it's oh like there's video God. there were video games at the time doing better cgi <laughs> yes oh goodness gracious uh -huh. anyway yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> what did you love yeah. about it <clears throat> yeah the same same sort of thing i i liked some of the uh characters a lot i like i thought the kind of inventing a the world was was pretty cool like just like the the floating mountains and the magnetic uh the magnetic field of the planet I thought was really cool. I, I liked the the culture of the Navi. I thought that was really neat. And the idea that like their, their ponytails were like actually like part of them and they could like kind of like commune with the tree and the different part, the different plants and the different animals and that sort of thing. I thought that was really neat. So just really imaginative stuff, you know, and I liked, I liked the, how it kind of grapples with themes of uh, the use of the military and the use of, uh, you know, consumerism and colonialism and the indigenous people and the environment and all those sort of things. I think, I think it was maybe a little heavy handed in places. Yeah. <laughs> um, like I, I think, I think kind of the, for me, the movie that does kind of like the, that does like more it ha that like has a clear moral and it doesn't do it in like an overhanded way as Jurassic park for me. Like it just does oh. it in a way that's not like, this is the idea we want you to yeah. come away with, you know, it just does it in like a very natural way. And I, I feel like th this movie, there's parts of it where it's like, we are hitting you over the head with our agenda and we want you to know what we think, you know, <laughs> it just, it's a little heavy handed in some places. So, yeah. um, and that gets into I, I've, my biggest problem with the movie very similar. Uh, but um, basically, that is just such a blatant ripoff of two other movies that predated mm -hmm. it, um, Pocahontas and Fern mm -hmm. Gully. Yes. Fern, uh -huh. I mean, Fern Gully, everyone talks about the Pocahontas connection, but everyone's forgetting the Fern Gully connection. Like, it is Very so blatantly so. a ripoff of both of those movies. Now, if you're going to rip off a movie so blatantly you got to do it as well as James Cameron did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like some of the, some of the, like the, the villains are kind of one dimensional. They're just kind of like, you know, greedy and mean because they're greedy and mean, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's, so I, I've, I've heard that the new movie is a little more complex. I haven't seen it yet, but our patron our once I see it, our patron exclusive content for this episode will be my review of that movie, but I got to go see it first. And then that will be available for patrons in the Awakened Catholic app. So let's dive into some of those themes. So the, the first one that we wanted to talk about was this idea of, you know, they're there, the, the humans are there on the planet to like reap the natural resources of this planet. There's this really valuable resource. I think they call it unobtainium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of a cheesy name, but you know, I mean, we got vibranium and adamantium and different, you know, coming up with a, a metal name is kind of, kind of hard, I guess, but unobtainium I thought was, was pretty goofy. Yeah. Um, but anyway, they're, they're there trying to get this very valuable resource and then they come into conflicts with, the indigenous, By, yeah, the indi specifically the indigenous people, the indigenous tribe yeah. of the of the planet. So, um, as Christians, as Catholics, how do we? What can we glean from this? Uh, what do we What do we see in this that's relevant to the faith? Hmm. Well, I mean, kind of what you see play out in the story is like, obviously, okay, all, any of this is going to be like spoilerish, like. If you haven't seen oh, yeah. it, it's, it's from 2009. Like, get, yeah. get on the bandwagon. <laughs> um, 
but uh, you know, you see play out like the bad guys, things don't go well for them. Okay, so what were the bad guys doing that kind of resulted in this? They were um, obsessively pursuing, uh, well, specifically the, the bad guys in this movie were a corporation that were pursuing this unobtainium because they wanted to make massive profits being the only corporation that was providing these minerals, the, you know, whatever. And we, we saw them go to whatever lengths were necessary. Mm -hmm. And ultimately it, it resulted in so much pain and suffering for so many people themselves, the bad guys, as well as for, um, the indigenous people that they were trying to exploit and, and discard, get rid of whatever. So, you know, the selfishness, the pursuit of this, you know, this greed, um, the, the greedy pursuit of the unobtainium, like resulted in suffering for themselves and for others. And I think that we see that play out when we do the same thing in real life mm -hmm. and ultimately are being vicious or, or, you know, the opposite of virtuous. Mm -hmm. Um, and when we are the opposite of virtuous, when we are vicious, our lives are about ourselves. Our lives are about the acquisition of, of whatever it is, whether it's like stuff or money or popularity or, yes. you know, whatever P we suffer and the people around us suffer. It's inevitable. It just is the way it is. It is. There's a, a, a great quote from St. John Paul II, who's on the poster behind you. We talk about him in like every episode. Yeah. So one, one of my favorite encyclicals uh, or letters by him is like t uh, an encyclical is like a, a when the Pope issues like an official teaching and uh, it's called Centissimus Anus and it's on uh, social justice and care for the poor and economics. He talks about capitalism and socialism and the, and the church's uh, you know, views on both of those. It's, it's really beautiful and it's kind of, um, Anyway, lots of, lots of people sleep on Santissimus Andrews, and I, I think everybody should, every Catholic should read it. It's just it really beautiful. But one of the things he says is he's talking about consumerism and how, uh, you know, we just use and use and use. And that's not only is that bad for the world and bad for the people who don't get what they need because we are hoarding more than we need, but also it's actually bad for us when we consume in that way. And so he's talking about consumerism and then he says, equally worrying is the ecological question which accompanies the problems of consumerism and which is closely connected to it in his desire to have and to enjoy rather than to be and to grow man consumes the resources of the earth and his own life mm. in an excessive and disordered way. I'm going to read that last part again. Yeah. In his desire to have and enjoy rather than to be and to grow, man consumes the resources of the earth and consumes his own life in an excessive and disordered way. So we spend all this time, and this is very much the, like the American dream. Like you got you to get what's yours. You got to have blessings on blessings and blessings, and I'm going to get my stacks, and I'm going to be dripping with diamonds. You know, like that's, that's what we see as like the American dream. I got to get, get what's mine, you know, grind and stack. That's what I'm going to do. But not only does that abuse the earth and abuses a lot of the other people, if that's your mindset, but you end up actually abusing yourself because mm -hmm. you're trying to enjoy and have rather than to just be and to grow. And I just, I think that's, that's so beautiful. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And in yeah. some, you know, it's when we look at something like the movie Avatar and it's, and it's these really extreme examples where we're traveling to another planet mm -hmm. and trying to destroy an alien race of indigenous people and whatever, all to acquire this obtainium. Like none of us are ever going to be in that situation. Um, but then you look at a movie, I forget what it's called by Nicolas Cage or not by him, but he's the the main actor. Um, where he's given a chance to see his alternate life if he had chosen differently. So in his life, he chose to to leave this girl that he was dating that they were deeply in love, but he chose to leave her to pursue a career and become super wealthy. And then he's granted this opportunity, I think by an angel or something, to see and live his alternate life. Um, and even though they're scraping by, they don't know how they're going to pay the mortgage, they have a job selling tires, I think. He has a job selling tires for his father-in-law and they don't have a lot of money at all. But he ends up so much happier with her in that life, with the children that they have. And like, it's such a beautiful depiction of what we're talking about. That's a lot more grounded than Avatar. Um, yeah. But but it's exactly that. Like we we constantly think to be happy, I need more stuff. To be happy, I need more notoriety. I need a bigger bank account. 
whatever it is, but that is yeah. not what makes us happy. What makes us happy might be the job selling tires for our father-in-law with a wife and kids, yeah. and we don't know how we're going to pay the mortgage, but we're happier. Very true. Very true. Very true. Um, so I want to, I want to, you know, the idea of environmentalism is very much something that is promoted by like protecting the environment, being green is very much something promoted by the politically left leaning. And I think in the Catholic church, especially in America, because those on the political left have so frequently been associated with abortion mm -hmm. and uh, abortion, quote unquote, rights. And those on the right have been more about, you know, protecting unborn life and the dignity of unborn life. The Catholics have much more associated with the political right than the left, even though, you know, the Catholic Church isn't Republican or Democrat. Like we, we have, you know, our moral teachings that have been informed for the last 2000 years. Um, I think oftentimes this is a subject where Catholics hear about the environment and caring for the environment and they say, oh, that's a liberal thing. Right. Like that is something that we as Catholics don't need to worry about. Right. We're pro-life, but the environment, whatever, like God gave us dominion. It says that in the book of Genesis, we're supposed to have dominion over the planet. And then at the end of time, like God's going to renew everything anyway. So what does it matter if we use up all the fossil fuels and, you know, have all this CO2 and, and, you know, what, what does it matter if biodiversity is going down and all these, all these animal species are going extinct? Like really that's like we as humans, like that's, that's our vocation that God has given us to, to have dominion over the earth. So I want to talk about like, how do, how do we respond to that in authentically Christian and Catholic way? Where, where can we see what, what's authentically Catholic in the desire to protect the environment, preserve the environment? That's such a good question. And you're dead on about what you were saying about the politics of it. Like we were, we're put in, at, at least in the West, in, in America, in the United States, we are put in this position where we have to choose a side left mm -hmm. or right, Democrat or Republican or whatever. And like, we're over here as Catholics authentically pursuing the good, true and beautiful, trying to be obedient to God's edicts. And we're over mm -hmm. here like, but neither party does that perfectly. So how do I reconcile, yeah. you know? Um, and and the other hard thing is that the information flow, especially what we're learning right now with the Twitter files, like everything is just so manipulated. And so like, yeah. even if I want to be a good Catholic that cares for the environment, that from the beginning of time, we were told by God, we are stewards of, we were given that office as a human race. We were given the office of stewarding the earth. How yeah. do I reconcile? How do I say as a Catholic, I'm going to do that, but all of the research I do to do so is so tainted by the left and the right skewing things to be more yeah. extreme in the directions. That, so it's such a complicated thing. And I think that yeah, and it's, it's hard to even, it's hard to even know what's true. Yeah. About right. Like, like, okay. Like tr trust the science. Well, this scientist is saying this. And then I hear this on site. Like it, it's, it's, it's hard to know. Um, and so I think that's somewhere where um, we need, this is somewhere where we need people who are not so ideologically biased right and we need good like good solid catholic scientists and christian scientists and people who who aren't aren't based on the ideology of it but are based on like what what is actually happening and 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 i, I think the catholic church because we have this long tradition mm -hmm. uh this long intellectual tradition are perfectly placed to do that so um a couple things that i i have turned to is one if you look back to that passage in genesis where it says you know god says and i give you dominion over the plants and the animals and the earth like where are Adam and Eve, where are humans created? It's in a garden. Mm. And gardens, on the one hand, gardens don't just happen, right? You don't just walk through the forest and find a garden. Like if, and if you did, you'd be like, hey, who planted this, right? Like gardens are things that take cultivation and intentionality. And so, yes, we are called to in some sense, you know, I know this can be a word that people don't like, but quote unquote, like civilize the earth, right? We're supposed to garden it and nurture it. But also, if you just take and take and take from a garden, pretty sure, pretty soon, that garden doesn't flourish anymore, right? Like mm -hmm. even, even farmers know they need to rotate their crops. They need to replenish the soil. It needs to be sustainable. And there's I, – I heard um, someone say one time when they were talking about this, like God created us in the Garden of Eden, not the strip mine of Eden, yeah. right? <laughs> like we don't just take and take and take. Like yes, we have a dominion over it and a certain control over it, but we also have this stewardship as you were saying. And, and I think – I love what Pope Benedict, who was our last pope, and Pope Francis, our current pope, have have said on this, and also John Paul II. But I feel like the last three popes, each one has kind of stepped it up in terms of uh, Catholic teaching on the environment. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Pope Benedict, this is from his encyclical Caritas and Veritate. Um, he says, the church has a responsibility towards creation, creation, and she must assert this responsibility in the public sphere. In doing so, she must defend not only earth, water, and air as gifts of creation that belong to everyone. She must above all protect mankind from self-destruction. There is a need for what might be called a human ecology, correctly understood. The deterioration of nature is in fact closely connected to the culture that shapes human coexistence. When human ecology is respected within society, environmental ecology also benefits. And so this is where I think like Catholic environmentalism and kind of like secular environmentalism diverge is a lot of times in like secular, like very left ideological environmentalism, humans are seen as the problem, mm -hmm. right? Humans are seen, in fact, some people say, well, I don't even want to have kids because, you know, they're so over, overpopulating anyway. And it seems like we'd almost rather have like more trees than more, more people. There's this very anti-human approach to a lot of environmentalism. Yeah. And what we see in John Paul II and Pope Benedict and Pope Francis is it's a very pro-life environmentalism. It's like, no, because the reason for creation is humanity. Like God made all this for us. And so this idea of a human ecology, Pope Francis then writes an entire encyclical on this idea from Pope Benedict called Laudato Si. And so what we see in the, the Catholic Church in the last like 50 years is three popes in a row are laying out this teaching in official teaching saying, yes, this is something we need to be involved in as Catholics. And each pope is, is, is stepping it up. And when you see that in the Catholic tradition, that, that's a sure sign that teaching on this is developing and growing in the same way that um, you know, John Paul II and, and Pope Benedict did with human sexuality um, in their teachings on theology of the body. Like We see the church teaching growing in this area and deepening in this area about our role as stewards to protect the environment and care for the environment. Um, and so on the one hand, like, yes, Catholics should absolutely be green. Yes, we should absolutely be caring for the environment, but we're not going to do it in the way that the world doesn't in a very like anti-human way, right? It's, yeah. it's a very pro-life environmentalism. So, yeah, completely. And the other thing that we miss in the creation story um, is the, the notion of, of what role relationship plays in all of this. And, and we'll, we'll get into this a little bit with um, when we get into some of the allegorical stuff in the movie Avatar. But um, when God tells Adam to name all of the creatures, mm. like that actually has so much more significance than just like, hey, here's a, here's a busy job for you, a busy work. Um, <laughs> you know, when, when in scripture, when someone is naming someone else, it represents relationship and it represents... Uh, dominion in a sense. So so Christ, what he does when he encounters the, the first bishops, the first apostles, he renames them. He gives them a new name. Um, and Christ is the new Adam, right? So there's a connection in, in all, everything that, that Christ does. There's a connection to the fulfillment of everything that came before it. And, and um, when when Adam is naming these animals, it's not just like, we have to call you something, so we'll go with squirrel. No, it's like, it reminds me of, of St. Francis, right? Like brother squirrel, brother moon, right? Like there's this, yes. this relationship dynamic that we totally lose when we're talking about the creation story. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, hey, your job, Adam, is to till, you know, is to trim the bushes and, you know, whatever. Like, no, your job, Adam, is to be in relationship with this creation yes. that I have given you. Like I, he, God gave us this creation and he wants yeah. us to be in relationship with it, not just happen to reside here. And, and I yes. think that we totally miss that. And it's, it's tragic because like my, my house, we have the, we, I think a, a militant army of squirrels that are literally always bombing our house with acorns. And we'll hear like 24 seven, we hear literally 24 seven, we hear acorns smashing into our house. And these, I, I swear these squirrels are literally bombing us with these acorns and and i think it's so charming you know it's it's so cute it's like brother squirrel brother squirrel maybe you hate me but brother squirrel so God bless something you. that something something that i've i've learned as yeah i've been a, mostly a stay-at-home dad the last few years is there's a lot of days i don't get outside much yeah. you know because i'm just in the house doing stuff and i've i've found as like something that's necessary for my mental and emotional and psychological health is like, I need to get outside for a little bit every day. So like once I like make the kids breakfast, a lot of times I just step outside for a few minutes, even no matter how hot or how cold it is. And I just like sit there and do like my morning prayers or do the morning readings yeah. and just 
in sometimes even if it's raining or it's cold or it's hot, just let that kind of soak in mm. because we live in a world where like, I didn't, I didn't make this, you know, I don't like the food that I ate this morning. Like, I don't, I don't really know where it came from, where from most of human experience, like, you know, if you ate bacon, you knew the pig or the guy who sold you the pig or the guy who sold you the bacon after he killed his pig, or like, you know, who knit you that shirt, like you knew where everything came from. It was part of that relationship yes. you were talking about. Um, and there's, there's lots of good things about this world in which I can go on Amazon and have something delivered to my house the next day. I know that's, that's wonderful in a lot of ways, but there's also this disconnection from relationship yeah. and it, 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 what often happens is it becomes what uh, Pope John Paul II called the culture of death mm -hmm. and what Pope Francis calls the throwaway culture. Yeah. And here's a, here, this, here's a quote from Laudato Si, Pope Francis's encyclical on the environment. He says, when nature is viewed solely as a source of profit and gain, this has serious consequences for society. This has engendered immense inequality, injustice, and acts of violence against the majority of humanity since resources end up in the hands of the first comer or the most powerful. The winner takes all. Completely at odds with this model are the ideals of harmony, justice, fraternity, and peace as proposed by Jesus in the gospel. Mm. And so, yeah, it, like we, you know, like we, you were saying before, you know, we'll never be in a situation where, you know, we're, we're on a foreign planet and we're like taking these precious minerals at the expense of like a, a you know, a subjugated people. But if you think about it, like where do all the precious minerals in these cell phones and these computers that we're using, like, where did all those come from? Mm. Like, do I know that like, this wasn't dung up, dug up by like some five-year-old in, uh, in like a, a cobalt mine in the Congo or something right. like that? Like, I actually have no idea because I'm not in that relationship. Yeah. Right. And so this is, this is a very much a pro-life issue that Catholics need to be a part of to be like, where are our, where is this stuff coming from? Yeah. Like, is this shirt I'm wearing? I mean, it's literally the, the first food I'm job eating. God gave us. Like, it's yeah. <laughs> it was like the defining job. Like, he didn't give him other jobs. He was like, here's what you're going to do while you're here. You know? Yeah. Um, so connecting all of this to your original question, like, how do we how do we navigate this difficult political situation uh, to try to be good stewards of the earth as Catholics? The, the tie-in from everything that we're saying here to me is the relationship thing. So I think about my kids, who obviously my stewardship of the earth as, as Nick De La Torre, as an individual, does not have anywhere near the importance of my stewardship over my children. Mm. But looking at that as a reference point, I don't know perfectly how to be a good dad. They don't mm. give you like a recipe for like, here is the exact way to approach every single situation. And no two situations are the same, by the way, you know? So, mm -hmm. so as a dad, as a father with my kids, I don't know what the crap I'm doing half the time. I'm just trying my best in the moment, in each situation to love my kids well and empower them uh, to be the best people they can be and essentially steward them. And so in a similar way with the environment, no, we cannot know the truth, the full unadulterated truth of global warming. We cannot know, it's way too politicized. But mm -hmm. all I care about is what can I do to care better for my planet? Does it mean mm -hmm. taking my, my can of carbonated water and putting it in the recycling instead of the trash, even if the impact of that one little moment is very insignificant, but you add all those things up, right? You do that throughout your life. Like, why not try a little bit harder? Like, it's just a different can. Just throw it in a different can, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that we're hesitant to do that because it's been so politicized, right? So there's that whole, you've, yeah. you've heard of the, the tree hugger, right? Well, yeah. that really is about struggling rightfully with the notion that there are people like what you were saying, the culture of death, that put the planet over human beings. Mm -hmm. And that is not okay. We cannot do that. Human yeah. beings are more important. So anyways, that's the tie-in is the relationship to my kids. I can't, yeah. I can't know perfectly, but I just try my best. Yeah. And I, I think that's, if, you know, if, if you're listening, listeners, and you're like, oh, yeah, like, I, I feel convicted by this. I, like, want to do more for, like, be a good steward of, of my environment. But, like, what am I doing? I'm, I'm raising a family or I'm going to work or I'm in school. And, like, what what can I do? Um, trying to find some some little things like, um, you know, daily practices, like you were talking about recycling. Something that my wife and I have done is, like, our power 
plan, like where we get our, our energy plan that we get our energy from. A few years ago, we switched over to an energy plan that is, it's like 100% renewable. Like most of it comes from like hydroelectric power and that sort of thing. And it's a little bit more expensive, but two things that that does is like, one, I consider that like part of our tithing, you know, like part of, I'm trying to vote with my dollars, you know, and it's not actually not that much more expensive, but I know that our energy is coming from renewable resources rather than coal, which is putting stuff into the atmosphere, maybe giving people cancer, you know, who, who, who knows what all is, is, is happening. Um, but the second thing it does is because it's a little more expensive, it makes me more aware. And I'm like, shut off the lights, you know, like, do I need to leave that, <laughs> that on all night? Do I need to be charging this thing? Do I need to, you know, have all this, all these electrical things going? So it makes me more aware of, of what I'm using and not over consuming. Um, but also it's a way to vote with my dollars. And, uh, you know, just to know that I'm, you know, in some small way, not contributing to yeah. as much, you know? Um, I mean, I still drive a combustion engine car and all those sorts of things. You know, there's only so much we can, we, we can do, but we can do something. Well, you know? and a lot of those kinds of things, it's, 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 it's not as small of a difference as like which utility company you're using, like yeah. paying for an electric car versus paying for a combustion car. It is like yeah. not close financially. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, and then you're still you're still plugging in your electric car to your house, which is probably getting its electricity from yeah. a coal plant, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, so that's <laughs> the other thing we got to be careful about is, like, the guilt yeah. thing that people, like, yeah. throw around. Yeah. Listen, just Kim Kardashian's jet and Air Force One are using astronomically more resources, non-renewable non resources, than, like, entire cities or states, and maybe even... Read like hemispheres, <laughs> like the, those <laughs> those jets on a daily basis are using yeah, so much lot. more. And so, mm -hmm. for for people on the political left, like a Kim Kardashian or whoever the president is at the time, who are going to throw around guilt, like you're not recycling that can, like that's a mm -hmm. the guilt thing is not cool because there's such double standards everywhere. I just need to be, you know, it, I'm not going to judge you, Mike, for how you handle this situation. I need to do my best. Just like we don't judge each other's parenting, or we shouldn't, mm -hmm. right? Because every situation is different. We just got to try our best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know we're talking about the left a lot here, but I think I think for for uh, those on the right, the the thing to caution against is to not just be like, oh, that's a liberal thing. Yes, that's right. Like, I don't need to worry right. about this because this is a liberal thing because uh, the last three popes <laughs> um, have is, something different yeah. to say about that. Like, we can't we can't just, we should be listening to Pope Francis more than Ben Shapiro. You know yes. what I mean? <laughs> so, well, it, it is such an ironic concept too because, the, you know, the whole notion of conservatism, what are we conserving? Like, yeah. I think we should, as a part of conservatism, be conserving the planet. <laughs> like, that yeah. should just be part Amen. of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amen. 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 All right. So part of this, we were starting to talk about relationship and I think this gets us into, um, talking about the relationship that the humans, the sky people, as they're called, um, have to the Navi, which are the indigenous people there. And, um, this is something that I think hits us very close to the heart in the Catholic church, because this is something that we have not always done well and sometimes have, have done pretty, pretty poorly. Um, you know, the Catholic church is very much wrapped up in, you know, Spanish colonialism and French colonialism. And there were some, a, a lot of, a lot of bad, nasty, um, you know, reprehensible things done in the name of spreading quote unquote civilization or spreading the gospel, um, in the way that, you know, or European Christians treated the indigenous people of North and South America and other places in the world too. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about that. And so like in the movie, what do, what do we see that we can, we can learn from, from the way that they're treating the indigenous people? Well, I mean, you know, if we'll, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt and, oh no, you know, we can't even do that because, so I was going to say, we, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, let's, 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 presuppose that the sky people, the humans from Earth, are not dehumanizing the Navi. Well, I mean, they literally aren't human, so that, that doesn't actually work. Um, but, you know, the, the key there is to see the other as the other, right? So as long as we can keep the Navi as like these non-intellectual, non-educated savages um, in our framework, then we can feel less bad about exploiting them or subjugating them or just obliterating their uh their whole structure of living the the whole faith system their planet literally um 
you know, so there is this this thing that we see all throughout history, and frankly, we all do it on some level, where in order to make ourselves feel better, in our minds, we dehumanize whoever it is that we need to step on or that we need to ignore in order to feel better about this thing. And that can take yeah. the form of like holding resentment because it makes us see the other person in a hateful way. It makes us see them as like, they're not good. They, they aren't as good as they should be. So I can feel this way and I can do X, Y, and Z. Um, and so there is this, just this notion of like, uh, for, you know, me making excuses to get away with whatever I need to get away with to feel good or to have what I want or, or whatever. So creating the other classification mm -hmm. for whoever, um, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's what you were getting at, but no, I think, I think it's absolutely true that it's the, the same thing that causes, the the sky the, the humans in Avatar the sky people to subjugate the Navi the same thing that caused Spanish colonialists to subjugate Native Americans is the same thing that causes uh, us in our society to subjugate the unborn mm -hmm. the immigrant um, those of different cultures or even our ideological enemies like how often do we talk about those people oh yeah. those people would just think this way or I can't believe the way those people act and we're talking about those on the left or those on the right and we put them in this whole camp yeah. and that is the humanization or I guess because we're talking about other persons who are not human species because we're talking about like aliens here with the Navi right. like depersonification yes, um, there you but go. the idea is there. there is a a person here with like an intellect and a will and a rational soul, right? And we are saying, oh, they're just this. They're they're subhuman. You know that you know unborn human is just a clump of cells, right? They're just the products of conception, right? They're just a choice. Or you know what? It, in, in like every genocide that's ever happened, there's always some sort of name that is given to the subjugated group. Like you say, oh, they're yeah. just they're just cockroaches. They're just a drain on society. Oh, they're just they're just illegal immigrants. Oh, they're just um, you know they're, it, you you can go through all the human rights abuses, and there's always some subjugation. Yeah. Um, and th this happened too again, even like um, you know Saint Juniper who is um, you know, like the founder of California and the reason why everything in California is named after a saint. Um, and he did a lot of work in, in, in baptizing like hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people. Um, you know, but the, the, we, we know in our church, the saints aren't perfect, you know, and they make some mistakes that especially we can see in hindsight. And kind of the, the model of the missionaries was that, yes, the indigenous people are humans, but they're kind of like children and they need to be taught. Okay. So it's, it's okay that it's okay to kind of, gather them up and, and teach them in these these special schools and we look back on that now and it's like pretty obvious to us that like no that's 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 pretty wrong and so i i think what we can learn from this is one just to have some humility mm -hmm. that like we aren't always the civilized ones yeah. sometimes the other person isn't the barbarian irrational person like there's just as much barbarian irrationality in us and to have some humility yeah. and try to see the other persons and the other quote unquote sides humanity yeah right try to see their humanity um and that way we don't dehumanize people and the second thing i think that we can learn from this is first of all none of that is to say that we shouldn't be evangelizing or spreading the gospel because we absolutely should but we should do it in a way that respects people's freedom freedom of conscience and their human dignity um but the second thing i was going to say um i can't remember so <laughs> do you have something yeah no i mean there? everything that you're saying it's kind of this elitism that what yes. i think is more important than what you think or more valid than what you think my needs are more important than your needs it's this it's this elitism that we see rampantly everywhere that everyone thinks they're better than than the than the other um and I, it just it's dehumanizing it's depersonalizing um it's it's all ultimately it's it's vicious it's sinful and we all do it. Even the people that agree with you about things, even you probably listening or, or watching, like we all do it. I do it. Mike does it. Like, and, and it's it's a tendency um, that we need to to work with the Holy Spirit to work out of our hearts. Um, you know, the ability to even 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 the act of evangelizing is so much more effective when we have realized our proclivity to behave that way. So for example, early on in my conversion experience, uh, coming back to faith, I was so radically excited about God and the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And my radical excitement came across pretty radically in a lot of different yeah. dialogues. Mm -hmm. And it guaranteed, I know for a fact, it pushed people away from the, from the truth. 
in contrast, I can sit down with people I care about now, even someone I don't care, I don't care about as much about or, or don't know personally, but most recently I was sitting down with someone I cared about deeply who is um, agnostic. And I just was like listening. I was just learning from them um, who they are, listening to their heart, not learning about how to become agnostic myself, but but I was just mm-hmm. learning who they are and what the reasons are for where they're at. And I did not push back at all because that's not what that conversation was for. But if I hadn't resisted or, or fought and worked with the Holy Spirit to resist that, to fix that tendency in my heart, to correct mm-hmm. someone because my way is better, um, that would have become a very negative conversation. And we, we have had so many great enriching conversations since then because of my humility in that first conversation. Um, and, and, and with that humility, something I'm, I'm hearing and what you're saying is that you also, even though you believe you're right and you have like the gospel of life and like the words of eternal life to share with him, you recognize that you might have something to learn from him too. Yes. Right. And that's what Pope Francis called accompaniment. Yeah. Right. Like we accompany people on this journey and that's part of evangelization. And we never want to like water down the gospel or water down the truth. Like we always want to proclaim the fullness of the truth, but we do it in a way where we're not superior. We're not elite. We do it in a way where it's, we're, we're friendship. We're accompanying these people and we recognize like, Hey, like, I'm a Christian, but that doesn't mean I'm like a better person <laughs> than you. Like you might really have something to teach me. And that's true. That's true. I wrote a blog post one time called things I've learned from my atheist friends. Like I have absolutely learned things from my atheist friends where like some, some of the most upright virtuous people in, that I've, I've known are atheists. And I'm like, huh, how do you do that? Because it's like, <laughs> for me, I kind of need a little bit of fear. I kind of need a little bit of reward most of the time. You know, I have a really hard time being a virtuous person yeah. without thinking like, oh, well, that's a sin. You know, I don't want to do we that. We should tag you know, that blog article in the moments. show notes. Yeah, I will. I will. I will. I remember the other thing I was going to say is that um, I think a lesson that we learned from looking back of the the, the history of colonialism and the, the mistakes that, that have been made and some places continue to be made is – that we should have an expansive version of human dignity and the human person and, and personhood generally, and not like a, not like a restricted view of personhood because I mean, we hear this in the pro-life debate all the time. Oh, they're not really a person because they can't live outside the womb. They're not really a person because they've got, they're not, you know, rational thinking yet. They're not really a person because of this. And you know, the same treatment was done to indigenous people. Oh, they're not, they're not really people, at least not the same type of people that we are because they don't have the same height of civilization or technology that we have. Mm-hmm. And I think this has implications for how we all treat each other, especially when people seem so different than us in their culture or their way of thinking or their ideology or their political leanings or where they live in the country, suburban versus urban. But I think two things in the future is one, if we come into contact with like extraterrestrial life that is rational, like there's going to be some people that are like, well, they're not humans. It's like, well, you're right. They're not humans, but that's, does that mean that they're not people? And the second place that I think this is coming even more quickly, and I know you and I have discussed this before, <laughs> yeah. we don't exactly agree, is with artificial intelligence. Yeah. Because artificial intelligence is starting to pass the Turing test, which is basically meaning that it's starting to be able to produce things as good or better than humans. It can like make art. It can make music. It can write essays in a way that is convincing and like you can't tell the difference between it and something a human produced. And if it, you know, like I think at some point we're going to have to answer the question. If AI gets advanced enough, like, is it a person, right? If it has an intellect and an imagination, like yeah. those are parts of what we consider to be parts of the soul, you know? And I think there's so many times in the past that we have come up against an intellig- a, a new, a new intelligent, life form that lives differently than us, like people from a different part of the world. And we thought, oh, well, they're not like us. So they're not really humans, like, or they're not really people. I think we might really make a mistake when it comes to AI, where we think, oh, because it's artificial, that it's not a real person. Cause I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I that we've just made that mistake so many times before. I totally agree with you. I think with AI, we, we probably while I think we still disagree, I think we probably agree more than you realize, but there's still a diverging point. Like for me, um, you know, I can see personhood in AI if it's sophisticated enough to be self-aware and, and you know, essentially is a person. Um, but that to me is not the same thing as metaphysically or theologically having a spirit, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, the word soul, you know, technically means any living thing. 
uh, the mm -hmm. spirit is like a theological, metaphysical, like it's it's beyond the physical world. It's something that only God can, we, we can create physical things, right? Mm -hmm. And AI is electrons and whatever, um, that's all physical, but we can't touch the spirit. We can literally not create spiritual unless we're cooperating with God to create a human in the womb. Um, mm -hmm. And so that to me is the diverging point is I don't believe that an AI could ever have a spirit unless God infused it with spirit, like he did with Adam when he blew into Adam. So anyway, that's tangential, but yeah, who knows? Yeah, but it's it's that that question is coming fast. Yeah. Like within a few years, we're going to be having these discussions. Yeah, um, and I think we need to be having these discussions. So it's super relevant. Anyway. I mean, there, there's the, have you heard of the new AI thing, the Chat GPT? I think is it. Yeah, called? that's what I'm talking yeah. about. Like writes essays. It's for you. not. Yeah. People are literally writing apps and like having philosophical dialogues with the AI. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it is crazy. All right, well, we're, we're, we're closing in on the end here, but there were some things that you mentioned about that there's some Catholic allegory oh. in this movie. And uh, so, so lay, lay this on me. Tell, me. tell me what you found in this movie. Oh, Miguelito. It is so much more than just some Catholic allegory. <laughs> this movie is riddled with Catholic allegory. And I'm pretty confident James Cameron is not Catholic. And so mm -hmm. it's incredible to me that as much snuck in maybe by someone else on the production team or just by the Holy Spirit. But it's insane how much allegory there is, specifically to Catholicism, not to Christianity as a whole. Um, it really is explicitly Catholic the way that I saw all of it. So, for example, um, when... Uh, I mean, I'm going to kind of build up from the base level, like less crazy stuff. So mm. when the Navi are interacting with creation, even an animal or whatever, um, you know, we were talking here about how God instituted everything in creation in a way that for us to have a relationship with it. Well, when the Navi are having a relationship with animals, with creation, whatever, they always incorporate this neural connection that you were talking about with their ponytails, it's literally exposed neurons that connect and interface with the rest of creation. So if they're riding an animal and they're not exploiting that animal like a lot of us humans do, they're having a relationship with this animal while they're riding it, like they care about it. They connect their, their neurons, the zahelu is what they call it. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this like very explicit way in which they have a real relationship. It's not just like, ah, you're my pet. I'm subjugating you lesser being like, there's a real authentic relationship there that I think we need to be informed by it. Not that we need to connect our neurons to animals, but like the, the more substantive thing behind that. When they have relation, by, by the way, I was I was disappointed in the movie when like the main the main guy and the main girl I'm forgetting their names, but like when they get together and like kiss and kind of like it's not like a sex scene, but it's no, like it, it is a sex scene. Yeah. Oh yeah, because they like anyway. But I was disappointed that like their ponytails didn't connect. Like, yes, I they did. Clearly, that's coming. Did they? Yeah, they did. I was actually about to bring that up. So you're you're oh, talking okay. about Jake. never mind. Maybe I'm remembering. Yeah. Wrong. So you're yeah. Jake Sully and Natiri, okay. um, and basically. They, uh, th when that's exactly where I was going next is that when they essentially are committing their lives to each other, so they're, they're kind of getting married in a sense. Um, and then they enter into the conjugal act with that. And it, it's, it's still, you know, as, as close to being a, a Catholic approach to marriage as you can get with the circumstances, um, considering <laughs> it's Hollywood, considering it's on an alien planet with an alien species, whatever, um, yeah. they, in the conjugal act, uh, when they're sealing the deal, they they connect their neurons, their their zahelu, and um, it's such a beautiful moment where we talk about how we become one flesh, and then when they do that, they really become one flesh, where their neural systems are literally interfacing and connected. Super interesting. Um, but what's really interesting is where they did this. Okay, we as Catholics have a rule by and large, unless you get some exemption from the bishop, that you have to get married in a church. Why? Because you're getting married in the presence of God. You're getting married um, surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. 
and and it's it there's there's a sacramentality to it and sacraments yeah. happen in the church these kinds of sacraments. yeah you don't get you don't get you don't get baptized on the beach or confirmed on a mountainside or you right. know it happens in the in the context of the community and it's not yeah. that it can't mm-hmm. theologically happen it's a tradition yeah. and a practice not to out of reverence for what's happening because uh, yeah. obviously and that the community and that the community is part of it it's not right. just those two people yeah. it's yeah so where Jake Sully and Natiri entered into the conjugal act and formed their union was in the tree of ancestors. And so they were literally surrounded by their ancestors. And get this, they have the communion of saints, okay? So the communion of saints is these trees that all of the, like, they're, they kind of look like glowing willow trees. All of the hanging, like, willow branches are all, like, these neural connectors that they can do the Zahalu with, and they're literally interfacing with their ancestors. They're praying with their ancestors, and those ancestors are connected to their god, which is uh, the great tree or the great mother tree, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're literally... They're interfacing with their ancestors and with their God, and then they enter into the conjugal act, and it's all—it's just incredible. Like mm-hmm. we interface with our ancestors in the communion of the saints when we pray to saints and all this kind of stuff, as well as when we receive the Eucharist. The Eucharist is essentially our zahelu. So when we receive the Eucharist okay. at Mass, okay. are you digging it? I'm digging it. Yeah. The, so when we receive the Eucharist at Mass, we're not only receiving God— but we're also communing with everyone else in the room who's receiving God because God is not actually broken up into little pieces. Like theologically, you can't separate God from God. There are not suddenly two gods just because there's two wafers. It's one God, yeah. two wafers maybe, right? So so you're communing with everyone else in that room that is also receiving the Eucharist as well as everyone else in all of history who has ever received the Eucharist or ever will receive the Eucharist, as well as the entire communion of saints who is communing perfectly in perfect union with God in heaven, you are communing with all of that when you receive the Eucharist. You're connecting yourself to all of that. And in Mind blown. and in <laughs> Avatar, when they are in their, their worship setting— they are all they all have like these little seats like if they're pews surrounding surrounding the great tree which is their god okay and they all have there's a halo spot at their pew so they're all connected simultaneously to each other to their god and to their ancestors and they are chanting a hymn and and swaying a little bit and they're all connected to this tree that is their god in other words the tree of life you could say and they're wow. all communing, and it literally looks like a church setting when it's happening. It's that's amazing, incredible. It's absolutely so amazing. It, it, that it's it's just like that part in the Eucharistic prayer in the Mass where the priest says, you know, and together with all the saints and angels in heaven, we sing in one acclaim, you know, and then we all sing, Holy, 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 Boom. Lord God of Lord God of Hosts, like Lord God of the hosts of heaven, of all the angels and saints, and like we, the the Church militant here on earth, or the Pilgrim Church on earth, along with the Church triumphant in heaven, are all singing this together. Yeah, yep. that's totally a communion scene. You're absolutely and right. then that's awesome. And then they they top it off, little cherry on top, with a Christological. Uh, you know, uh, call back to the death and the resurrection of Christ when Jake Sully in his human body dies, but mm. comes back in his glorified form as a Navi. As an eight foot tall a, Navi with blue skin. Yes, but but stronger, <laughs> faster. He had been paralyzed. He is no longer paralyzed as a Navi. Oh, wow. And that death and resurrection happens in connection to the tree of life. So literally, the tree of life um, brings up its its little tentacles, its little va- vines from, from the ground beneath it, and it surrounds and engulfs Jake Sully's dead body. And then Jake Sully comes back as this Navi, the Navi, the, 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 the avatar body, which was a, a soulless, lifeless, biological thing, um, mm-hmm. it is infused with Jake Sully's being, but it's done through the tree of life, through their God. And so our wow. death and our resurrection is also in the tree of life that is the cross, that is God. It's incredible. Wow, yeah. That's and t- James you're, Cameron you're, is not it, Catholic. I get it. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's but but that but that desire that desire for communion with one another and that desire for communion with something higher than ourselves is like written on the human heart yeah. right like we all want that and we all recognize that like the sacrifice and suffering in this life like when united to like a, a greater purpose with like the truth and goodness and beauty of 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 all the you know despite all the awfulness of this world yep. when we unite our suffering at the service of like the goodness of this world that resurrection is possible yes right and and i think all humans even if we don't believe that we want to believe yep. that there's some part of us that desperately wants that and that's at least that's what i found in jesus and that's what i Amen. found in the catholic church is i found that communion you know and not that i haven't been hurt by people in church because i have and not that i haven't you know found judgmental people or haven't even been that judgmental person at times because i have um but what I found in the gospel, what I found in the teachings of the church and what I found in my community of the church and through the sacraments, mm -hmm. that's what I found. That the answer to that desire in my heart for communion with something bigger than myself to a community bigger than myself yep. and that it gives meaning to my suffering and to my sacrifice yep. and hope that it's, it's all going to make sense one day. And I won't, I won't always have to live with the tears and sufferings of this life. And so, that is what we yeah, see in the archetype beautiful. of Jake Sully in his, in his story, wow. in his arc. Um, he is one of the sky people. He initially doesn't care about the Navi. He initially is right in step um, with, with everything that's going on uh, with the sky people. And the transformation that happens in him and the redemption that happens in him and, again, his brokenness, both spiritual and physical, are all redeemed in the tree of life, in God, when he is resurrected with a body that is not paralyzed, so a body that is not broken, into his true identity, which he finds to be with the Navi and with this God. And we, our true identity is in heaven, and our true identity is healed. Our, like We need to pursue that in God and in heaven, and all of our brokenness, all of our yuckiness, everything that's behind us, like it, it is going to be truly behind us in the resurrection. It's really amazing. Something else that, that makes me think of that is tied back to our discussion from before is uh, one of the things that the church teaches is we experience Christ in prayer, we experience Christ in scriptures, we experience Christ through the sacraments, we experience Christ through the, the teachings of the church. We also experience Christ in the poor. Oof. We also experience Christ in one another, especially in one another when that person is different than us and especially in, in, in the suffering and in the poor. And that's what Jake finds is that with this marginalized group, he finds something deeper, some deeper beauty. Yes. And that, that is something that I know, I know for me, some of my deepest experiences of God have been my experiences of, of working with the poor. And the, the, the church has these beautiful teachings on that we're called to be in solidarity with the poor, to be a, a one, not just write a check, but to be of one heart and mind with the poor and to, to treat those who have less than us as our brothers and sisters, and not just as, you know, people that we, we give charity to with the sort of elitism that you were talking about before, yeah. you know, you have this kind of like savior complex. It's like, no, like we have something to learn from them. They have something to give to us. Um, and so in encountering the poor, like often, I think, uh, mother Teresa called it, we, we see Christ in his most distressing disguise or something mm. like that. So, Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Well, you just blew my mind. I got. I need to go watch this movie again because it's been it's been a little while. I, I watched a couple of recaps, but I need to I need to go back through. All right. So I always at the end of my shows ask my guests if they would give me just kind of one gospel takeaway uh, because I told my listeners at the beginning that I would give them some practical tips to take with them today. So let's think of one thing each of us that we, for we can take from this conversation to help us know God's love and live God's love better okay. today. I got mine. Go. Okay. So so I'm going to give you two. One is, no matter how broken you are, spiritually, physically, whatever it is, um, redemption and rebirth and resurrection are found in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, mm. blessed be his name, in the tree of life, um, which is the tree upon which he was crucified, and from it, in eternity, shooting into the past, into the future, from it is flowing his salvific grace. Um, and, and it, Preach. yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, um, no one is too far gone. No one is too broken for, for him to heal and, uh, to resurrect. Um, and then the second thing is simply that we were as a human race, and that means each of us individually. And that means all of us together, we were as a human race, given the task of stewarding and being in relationship with this creation 
And um, it's not meant to be some daunting, guilt-ridden thing, but rather an opportunity to just look for the smallest ways to, you know, over time, more and more, be a better steward. And you can do it. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I think for me, um, so much of the things we talked about, it can all seem so daunting. Like, what am I supposed to do about the fact that the way we live our lives is polluting the world? What am I supposed to do about the fact that the metals in my cell phone or even in my electric car, you know, might have been dug up out of the ground by a five-year-old in the Congo? Like, what am I supposed to do? But there's so much injustice that can just seem like so overwhelming. And I think um, the church shows us that like turning to the Lord in prayer, like prayer transforms us mm. and kind of guides us because we can't do everything, but we can do some things and prayer can guide us in directions to where we can do our, our little thing. Um, and the other thing is kind of what I was saying at the end is to have solidarity and to kind of go out of our way to try to find opportunities where we are with people who are different than us, especially the poor and the marginalized and those who have less than us. Because a lot of times once you spend time with other other people that are very different, some of the solutions start to start to pop up. Some of those things start you start to get ideas for how can I how can I help this situation? How can I help this person? How can we together help this situation? Um, so anyway, that's my that's my challenge for myself and, and and for my listeners. So I want to wrap everything we have done here in prayer. Nick, would you close this in prayer? Sure, sure. In the name of the- listeners, wherever you, listeners wherever you are, let's take a moment to pray. Yeah, if you're driving, don't close your eyes. In the name of the Father, <laughs> Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you so much um, for this episode, this conversation we've had. Um, Thank you for the gift of our lives, the gift of uh, this earth, and um, for holding us in existence with your love, Lord. We ask you to shine a light in our lives to the ways in which we can come closer to you and the ways in which we can be better stewards of all that you've given us um, in relationships with each other, in relationship with you, and, and in relationship with creation. We love you, Lord, and we pray all of this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Nick. And uh, if people want to find out more about you, where should they go? AwakenCatholic.org. Amen. Amen. And you you are in two shows on Awakened Catholic. You run your show, The Awakened Catholic Show, and also The Prodigal Life with uh, your two co-hosts. That's true. And I'm actually in a third show on Awakened Catholic right. called Awaken the Word. And it's a daily scripture oh, reflection yeah. I do. It's three minutes every single day. It's really, really quick, little bite-sized scripture reflection. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've I've done a handful of those oh, that's the right. last few yeah. months too. So I help I help out every once in a while. Yeah. So yeah, very good. All right, cool. So listeners, thank you so much for hanging with us. Please let us know what you think of the original avatar. If you've seen the new one, you can throw your thoughts on that in the comments as well. We will put all this stuff that we've talked about in the show notes, especially those quotes from Pope Benedict, Pope John Paul II, and Pope Francis. I'll put that because I know sometimes you hear the quote and it's it's hard to um, remember. So I'll, I'll put all that in the show notes along with some other quotes that I've I've pulled from different places in Catholic teaching as well. Um, so if you, uh, if this show has touched you, if part of this conversation is just like kind of set your heart burning, I would really encourage you to share it with someone. And uh, that really helps us out. That's how this show has grown so much this year. I'm also going to do something fun for the end of the year, because this uh, will be our last episode before the end of the year. If you follow me on Instagram and on Facebook, I'm going to make a little survey for uh, a couple like, what are your favorites of the year? So like your favorite cold open, your favorite episode, your favorite guest. So if you want to vote on on those things and I'll, I'll put it out on my social media. So make sure you're following me on Instagram and Facebook and I'll make sure I put that out there. And if you really want to keep this show running and help it to thrive and reach more people, you can become a patron by going to popculturecatechism.com. There are six tiers of giving that you can choose from. Each one comes with perks and all those tiers uh, get access to the exclusive content. All my talks that I give in my personal speaking ministry go in the Awaken app in the Pop Culture Catechist community and also exclusive content for each episode. So like I said, my review of the new Avatar movie will be in there once I see it, uh, and that'll be in the Awaken app as well. And the Awaken app is getting an awesome new update. So uh, make sure you check it out. It's the, the new app is, is beautiful. I want to give a special thank you to all of our patrons, but especially Tom and Emily Camberiati, uh, Bob and Lisa Tenney, Steve and Maggie Hubbard, and Carl and Melissa Gore, and all our patrons who su- support this show. Speaking of the Awaken app, it's not just for patrons. It is also a free app. Um, it has uh, a great Catholic and Christian community for like-minded people that's not so toxic as a lot of places on social media. It also has a great Christian prayer library and music library, and it's just a hub for all the Awaken shows. And then if you're a patron, 
patron, you also get access to all the exclusive content uh, from that show and other stuff that we do sometimes for Lent or Advent or other little initiatives that we run as well. And you help run the studio and everything that you see here. So thank you so much. We love you. Have a great year. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing this show and, and liking us and reviewing us and all the things that you do to help this show spread. We love you. God loves you more and we'll see you next time.